हेलो एवरीवन आई होप यू आर एंजॉइंग द फर्स्ट डे ऑफ टेस्ट म्यू 2023 एंड एक्साइटेड फॉर दिस सेशन ऑन एंश्योरिंग क्वालिटी इन डेटा एंड एआई आई एम हिमांशु आई वर्क एज अ मार्केटर एट लैमडा टेस्ट एंड टुडे आई विल बी योर होस्ट फॉर दिस सेशन एंड जॉइनिंग मी टुडे इज भरत हेमचंद्रन भरत इज अ ट्रेल ब्लेजर इन क्वालिटी एश्योरेंस स्पेस हैविंग वर्कड इन सॉफ्टवेयर इंडस्ट्री फॉर 16 प्लस इयर्स भरत हैज बीन एवरीथिंग from a developer to becoming the director of IT hi varad how are you hey how are you himanshu i'm i'm doing good so talking a bit about our today's topic as we all know the ai systems are becoming more and more sophisticated it is important for all of us to adapt and extend our uh, legacy quality assurance methods to meet the new world challenges and that's exactly what we learn in today's session and before we move on uh, there is just one last thing that if anybody has any kind of questions please feel free to re, uh, go to the q and a section which you can see on your right side and uh, we will be taking all the questions uh, uh, when we are approaching the end of this session uh, now uh, please join me in welcoming bharat hemachandran over to you bharat awesome thank you so much for that wonderful introduction himanshu it's a uh... Pleasure and an honor to be here in front of all you folks. Uh, cool. So let's get learning today. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, quality in the world of uh, data and AI. Uh, so anything else you want to? Can we get started? Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, we can get started now. Okay. Wonderful. So uh, just in the interest of time, I think we'd like to take uh, questions at the end. Uh, so please do uh, put down any questions that you have, and I'll try my best to answer any of the questions that you have uh, by the end of this session. Uh, so, given the the in the interest of time, let me just uh, you know get started with this particular session. So today we're going to be talking about uh, you know how to look at quality from a data and AI ecosystem perspective. So let's take a look at, at uh, you know how do we really Uh, think about measuring uh, quality in this particular world. Uh, so, we'll before we can actually measure something, we need to really define what it really means. Um, so, let me uh, thought. I mean, give you guys my perspective on what I feel quality means in this particular world. Uh, I've come up with a with a framework in terms of uh, what quality means and how we could uh, possibly measure that. And uh, this is the five pillar. Uh, approach to uh, defining quality and perhaps looking at quality in this particular world. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what this means in terms of, you know, the traditional roles that we have uh, today in software development, and how uh, you know these changes in terms of what we're looking at, uh, you know, measuring quality, how it gets uh, measured, and what we define it as. Uh, you know, what kind of impact does it have on a traditional Developer role, a QA role, a BA role, etc., and uh, perhaps uh, you know just sum up with uh, what we can think of comes next in this particular world. So one of the big problems in terms of uh, the world of data and AI is that it's not necessarily clear in terms of what is a good quality system uh, that measures quality in a data and AI perspective. Uh, the confusion comes from the fact that you could have a perfectly uh you know a good system in terms of uh, you know your traditional application measures uh it could be performant it, the security could be great uh you could have a, a functional system that works very well uh so defining quality becomes a little bit uh, tricky because you don't really understand how do you really look at this and say that this is a, a good or a well defined system or a good quality system versus a bad quality system so the general definition of you know just meeting the functional and the cross functional requirements for a traditional system uh, do not uh, you know not sufficient uh, in a data and a ai system so gives I mean that said so how do we really look at measuring data and quality in uh, you know these kind of systems so i've been working on this for a few years now and uh, i felt that one of the best ways to be able to articulate how we can measure you know quality in this uh, world is to perhaps take a look at uh, systems that were uh, from an application perspective great 
uh, they met all the functional and cross-functional requirements that you might require of them, but still were considered to be failures. So let's take a look at uh, five use cases. Uh, the first being uh, Google Flu Trends. I'm not sure how many of you folks have actually used uh, Google Flu Trends, but uh, when I was in the US, I, I definitely found this to be very useful. Um, so Google uh, you know, Flu Trends was a tool that was uh, used to predict the outbreak of, of flu uh, in the US and uh, some other locations that they were able to model this data on based on the Google search terms that people used from those particular areas. So whether you search for a medicine or you look for particular medical terms associated with uh, fever or you know symptoms, for example, uh, the Google flu trend model was able to uh, accurately predict you know the outbreak of flu uh, as you can see from the graph uh, you know very accurately for the first couple of years and that's because uh, you know the system worked pretty well uh, it actually was uh, uh, pretty much in line with what the cdc did uh, who had access to all the doctor data all the patient data in the us and were able to accurately estimate you know flu outbreaks uh, based on uh, so much historical data that they had uh, so what fell apart, right? So as you can see towards the latter part of this graph, the lines don't really match up. The Google flu trends, uh, you know, actually predicted almost two times the outbreaks that the traditional models uh, predicted. It wasn't that the system was changed. It wasn't an update. It wasn't a change in the model. Uh, but what really changed was the way that the data was being used. The way that people searched for, uh, you know, flus, or, or uh, you know, things related to flu was very different from the way that they perhaps uh, changed or, or, or uh, you know, looked at it before. Uh, maybe people were more internet savvy, maybe uh, people searched more, maybe there were more robots. Uh, but whatever the, the reason, the model fell apart and it, was not, and it was so disastrous at predicting flu trends that they stopped using this going forward. And the reason for this is something called a data shift, which is basically that everything remained the same, but the way that the model uh, was, or the way that the model used the data to predict or to do something changed completely. So the data quality uh, that was coming into the system, even though it was algorithmically perfect or algorithmic, algorithmically good enough to be used uh, by the system, it fell apart in terms of being able to do what it was supposed to do. So from this, we can you know, kind of make out that the quality of the data that you have in your system, whether it is uh, you know, still applicable to your uh, existing use case, or whether it is uh, you know, data that is incorrect or bad data is very important for you to take a look at. Now let's take a look at a second uh, example. Uh, let's take a look at the Apple card. So this was launched with much fanfare, uh, you know, a few years back, but it was uh, it ran into a host of problems. Uh, you know, even though that, uh, even though you know, the, it was meant to be a system that was supposed to evaluate people, uh, people, and come out with a credit score for that person based on a very fair data. It did not even have, uh, let's say, the gender or other discriminating uh, characteristics that traditionally people use to. Uh, perhaps uh, you know determine a person's uh, credit limit uh, before. Uh, this was uh, you know exemplified by the fact that uh, Steve Wozniak's wife, uh, who also applied for this card, was given a much lower credit limit, uh, you know, than Steve uh, himself, uh, because of the way that the algorithm worked. And the surprising thing was that the gender was not even a parameter that was used uh, to determine a person's profile or be able to. Uh, create, uh, you know, a, a credit limit uh, for a particular person. There were algorithmic al algorithmic flaws uh, that were yet to be determined, and uh, the company that was running this, I believe it was uh, uh, Morgan Stanley, who was actually running this particular uh, algorithm, they had to, uh, you know, stop using this to figure out what was the problem with the particular algorithm, the explainability and the reason for this particular algorithm to produce the results that it did uh, could not be explained easily. Uh, so explainability and having the right model in play 
uh, is something that is very important in addition to you know the cross functional and the functional uh, requirements let's take a look at a third uh, example right so this was uh, something that happened in 2017 so equifax had a huge data breach which led to uh, an enormous number of uh, you know accounts being leaked and uh, it caused a huge fine to be levied on equifax and when a root cause analysis was done on this particular problem uh, you know it was found that everything was good except for one security vulnerability patch that was not applied by the by the team uh, in time and this patch was uh, you know exploited by hackers who were able to then steal this huge amount of data which caused uh, an enormous uh, you know burden on the company uh, it was a loss of uh, credibility uh, for the company itself not to mention you know so many uh, accounts were uh, stolen and uh, so many people's uh, uh, data was uh, compromised due to this whole uh, problem due, due to the a uh, small vulnerability in their infrastructure so we've talked a little bit about uh, algorithmic quality we've talked about data in the system but the infrastructure supporting that system seems to be just as important as the the data and the algorithms being used themselves so now let's move away from the the technical aspects of it let's take a look at perhaps a system that worked extremely well uh, so cambridge analytica you know uh, was in the news for a while uh, you know they were on uh, they were thought to be people who uh, you know were influencing elections by misusing customer data that was actually meant for something else so facebook collected a lot of customer data uh, you know using a game uh, you know which was uh, which asked people to uh, go through a few surveys or and a couple of other games and uh, you know got people's uh, profiles and consolidated all that information and this information was used by cambridge analytica uh, to you know do wrong right in terms of it was used to influence uh, people's uh, mindsets to create propaganda to uh, you know play a part uh, that most people that gave this data willingly to facebook would never have consented to in the first place so it's not that the system was uh, was incorrect functionally cross functionally uh, data quality wise uh, infrastructure wise and from an algorithm perspective it in fact did everything it was supposed to but still it was a huge failure and the failure was because of the ethical reasons behind which this particular system was used the quality of the system was compromised by the very use case that was uh, you know that this entire platform was built on and this caused huge disrepute both to facebook and cambridge analytica and uh, you know they ran into a lot of problems around the world in terms of you know the software being used for all of these uh, uh, you know things right so here is another thing that we need to think about in addition to the technological aspects of it we need to think about the compliance and the ethical reasons behind which a use case you know is is mentioned or is given for the use of of data or ai the last is an external factor that most people you know or most organizations do not have too much control over and these are external uh, factors such as regulations so the gdpr is perhaps uh, you know the best known example there are plenty of others like the sarbanes oxley in uh, you know the uh, the financial world or the hipaa in the healthcare world for example and these are regulations that are uh, imposed upon organizations uh usually by governments or or by other organizations that uh, you know uh, monitor the use of of data or use of assets in, to be able to uh, you know be monetized in some way or the other so the gdpr for example brought huge sweeping changes uh, to the way that uh, organizations were able to store use and uh, process data on a regular basis so people uh, you know in the organizations needed to think a lot about how do we you know define policies uh, regarding you know the use the consumption or the processing of data the exposure of data uh, there were huge changes that needed to be made not only from a technological perspective but also from a process perspective access to data authentication authorization 
the ability to be able to use all of this uh, information to create value for the organization. All of these had to be governed in some way. And, you know, the, the concept of data governance, uh, you know, kind of really grew during this time, especially, uh, you know, when uh, policies such as the GDPR came into play. And uh, companies have to have, you know, this also defined because without this, you know, it doesn't matter how well the system performs, how, uh, you know, what kind of a marvel the, the engineering behind creating a platform like this is, it really doesn't matter because you would not be able to use it or you would run into huge problems with the uh, you know areas that you're actually hoping to uh, create value or create uh, some kind of commercial interest using our platforms so now that we've talked about uh, these five cases right let's let's see what really changes in terms of uh, you know this particular uh, uh, aspect of looking at quality from a data and ai perspective so we said that in addition to your typical functional and your cross-functional requirements, you need to have good data quality. Uh, you need to guard against data shifts or changes in user behaviors that would, uh, you know, make your existing system obsolete. You need to have explainable and working, you know, data models or AI models that you're using. You need to ensure that the infrastructure that you have is secure it has good governance practices it is maintained well you have to meet compliance and ethics standards uh, you have to conform to the data governance and regulations that are imposed on the industry by external forces so given that uh, as i said you know i've come up with this with this high level model called the five pillar model which looks at each of these five different parameters individually now you can double click into these and get a lot more details. I mean, let's take a look at, you know, what each of these things mean. So data quality is perhaps what most people are familiar with, uh, you know, when dealing with data and AI systems, the quality of the data uh, from, I mean, can be measured using a large number of, of uh, uh, characteristics. And this usually comes under data profiling. So things like the freshness of your data, the completeness of your data, the accuracy of your data, consistency, the various parameters that are used depending on the platform that you're using uh, and, the, and the activities that you're performing, uh, you know, that, that governs, you know, how your data quality is managed. So profiling your data is extremely important. There are some great tools that allow you to be able to do this. Uh, some things that uh, we use a lot uh, at work is uh, DQ. Uh, so DQ is one of the uh, you know, open source software that can be used over here. Uh, Great Expectations is another wonderful framework that allows you to, uh, you know, do data quality checks and profile your data on a regular basis. Uh, this can be in incorporated with your uh, existing pipelines to make sure that the ingestion of your data, transformation of your data gets profiled on a regular basis. Uh, data cleansing, again, is extremely important. Uh, you know, anonymizing your data or uh, making sure that the data does not expose any PII data, this identifier data that uh, could lead to, you know, uh, issues with uh, the governance or the regulations that are imposed on the data that you have. Validating your data to make sure that it still holds true uh, in terms of the way that you're planning to use it, uh, whether it is for an AI system, whether it is for your uh, existing data systems, uh, whether it is for your data mesh, it doesn't matter what platform or paradigm you're using, the validation of that data has to make sense. You need to be able to track the lineage of your data. So you need to be able to uh, identify the source of your data, how it has transformed, what has happened to it, uh, and you know how that data is used from the beginning to the end, how it is ingested, where it is ingested from, what kind of data does it need to have. Etc. And that's where something like metadata management, for example, becomes extremely important for you to be able to do so. So the Apache uh, tool framework has wonderful tools uh, that address a lot of these. Uh, so in addition to these, uh, there are a lot of providers of, of uh, you know data quality uh, parameters or, or tools that help you automate this and create dashboards that will help you uh, you know manage the quality of all this data that you have. 
The next thing that we need to talk about that's extremely important, especially given today's world, uh, with the explosion of generative AI, the explosion of of uh, you know large language models and uh, people rushing you know over it, I mean trying to find uh, you know uh, good use cases to be able to use all of this. So making sure that your algorithm or model quality is good is an extremely important activity today. Typically, uh, it is not usually the QAs that do this. You need to have a good background in data science or the ability to be able to understand what uh, an AI model looks like, the algorithm behind the AI model, the techniques behind uh, you know, how the AI model works, and, and things like that. So this might require uh, someone to have uh, experience or a lot of, of knowledge uh, to be able to do something like a model validation. But uh, interfacing with the folks uh, like the data scientists, data analysts, uh, the ML engineers that make the pipelines happen in terms of making sure that uh, you know that the uh, AI model is constantly being changed and, and tracking those changes is extremely important. Where QAs play a large part over here, we'll cover a little bit more during uh, you know, the later part of this session. But uh, it is extremely important for people to communicate with all the people that are involved in creating, extending, and developing uh, this particular model. So in addition to the way that the model has been developed or the way that it works, it's extremely important to make sure that uh, you, know, you check the model for things like bias, for example. Again, there are uh, amazing tools uh, such as uh, you know, the IBM Fairness 360 tool that uh, exists in the open source world that allows you to be able to do a lot of uh, this kind of bias testing on your models. And this is something that a lot of QAs do get involved with. Uh, uh, this, do, this involves thinking about a user's perspective and being able to make sure that you, know, you cover all the scenarios that you need to in terms of uh, being able to detect, detect uh, skew towards particular uh, categories, classifications, user types, or you know, anything else that you can think of, right? So a lot of people who've used uh, Midjourney, uh, you know, give, ask Midjourney to create uh, pictures of uh, people from particular countries or uh, people of particular professions, and uh, you know, you can find so many articles in the in the internet today which says, hey, you know, Midjourney is biased because it considers a doctor to be of a certain ethnicity and a particular uh, height or, you know, something like that, right? So those are all examples of, of bias in your system. And it is extremely important for you to be able to, uh, you know, work with your AI models and your data to make sure that all of this stuff happens. Uh, I think there was an earlier session today, if you did it, and, who, uh, and the gentleman over there mentioned that your training data, your testing data, is extremely important and the quality of that determines the quality of your system eventually. So even though the algorithms and everything that you use is wonderful, if you have a bias in your training data or in your validation data, it is going to give you uh, results that are contrary to what you expected. And this plays a lot into the interpretability and the explainability of your issues. So something that a lot of people don't pay too much attention to, but something that I have found to be extremely important, uh, especially having worked with uh, large language models over the last couple of years, is tracking your model's uh, evolution over time. So there are a lot of changes that are made to the model, both internally and externally from a code perspective, as well as from a data perspective. We talked about you know the training data, the validation data, et cetera. And all of these, uh, have a huge effect in the way that your your algorithms and your models work. So making sure that you're tracking, you know, how all these changes uh, affect the quality of your system is extremely important. Uh, you know, recently a lot of OpenAI uh, users have complained that, uh, you know, the recent models that OpenAI has released have depreciated in quality compared to the earlier models. So even though you know a lot of models have been, uh, the newer models have extra training data, uh, have more recent training data, they don't seem to perform as well as the older training data. Or something has changed which has skewed the, the results that are produced by these. So it's extremely important for you to understand that 
a more recent model does not necessarily mean a better model. You have to understand what each model that you use is able to produce for you over a bit of time. So being able to roll back, being able to understand which model suits your work best is extremely important. And being able to keep tracking this with changes to the model is something that you should do on a regular basis. The next thing is, is uh, you know, tracking infrastructure quality. Now, there aren't any tools per se that uh, I would recommend for this more than best practices. Uh, there are, uh, you know, all the platforms, uh, you know, today, the cloud platforms where usually all of these are hosted, provide you with a slew of tools that should be able to give you good inputs in terms of the, the memory, the compute power, and all of that stuff. However, there are a lot of best practices related to the process of maintaining infrastructure that are extremely important. It's very important for you to do uh, proper infrastructure testing, right? So to be able to make sure that, uh, you know, all the, the systems, the cloud that, uh, and the, all the servers that you're using are of, you know, optimum quality. You need to make sure that you don't uh, repeat the mistake that we saw in the Equifax uh, example of not having your system completely up to date. You need to plan for disaster recovery. You need to plan for capacity upfront to make sure that you don't run into availability or reliability issues. You need to keep testing your configuration to make sure that there are no dependency issues, there are no change management issues uh, related to you know, the, the libraries that you're using. Uh, something as simple as a change in the version of the library that you use could bring down your system or could cause your system to perform unpredictability. So making sure that all of these work as you expect is extremely important. So let's get to ethics. So although I've listed ethics both, in my opinion, this deserves a place, you know, much further ahead, right? So you really have to think a lot about what, you know, ethics really means in uh, this world. You have to wear the hat of what is my system, you know, being used for? Is it violating the values of my organization or the values of what I hope to achieve using my particular system? So. Even though, you know, I've listed it as the fourth pillar, you need to start thinking about ethics and the way that you are planning to use your, your system or the quality of the use case that you have in terms of its impact, in terms of its uh, uh, outcomes and its ability to influence, uh, you know, other platforms or the general thinking of people. Uh, because data and AI is extremely powerful in terms of what it can do. So making sure that you you wear the hat of being able to understand the the ethics and the guidelines of what you're planning to do is extremely important. It's, in, it's very important to set guidelines in terms of what you can and cannot do, uh, guardrails uh, for any system, even uh, you know something that a lot of companies are working on. So especially at my company, ThoughtWorks, uh, you know, we are working on a system of guardrails, uh, especially in the generative AI world, because there are a lot of things that we see in the uh, generative AI uh, world where uh, you know, there are hallucinations, there are issues regarding the, the source of data that, uh, you know, that is used to be able to create the predictions that the generative AI models do. Uh, there are issues around where you can and cannot use you know, all of these models. So client data, for example, should not be touched unless you have explicit permission of the client. So these are all examples of, of guidelines or guardrails that you can create for yourself or your organization in your company. So these are all things that determine the quality of the service that you provide by uh, you know, employing these particular uh, systems. You need to have uh, you know, good risk management audits and, uh, and uh, processes related to looking at you know, what you're doing on a regular basis. This should typically be done by a third party or by someone outside of the system who is able to come in with a fresh perspective and make sure that all of the things that you folks are doing are you know, meeting the guidelines that you have set for yourselves or for the organization itself. You need to be very mindful about the regulatory compliance and making sure that you're not exposing any data or anything that could cause uh, security or privacy concerns uh, to your end users or even the people that you're pulling all this data from. The last is, you know, data governance. Again, uh, it's listed last, but does not necessarily mean 
that it is of less uh, quality in terms of uh, uh, you know what is very important over here data governance like i said is something that is uh, spawned more recently uh, and is a mix of of technical and uh, functional related issues uh, making sure that you know a lot of this comes down to creating service level objectives for your organization making sure that you have policies or making sure that your uh, organization is thinking of the right policies in terms of data privacy in terms of data security uh, that there are policies in terms of authorization or the authentication of data making sure that there are stewards uh, for all the data sources or all the data platforms that you have to enable you know accountability or to make sure that there is proper uh, you know guidance in terms of where and when something should be used there have to be you know processes like audits and checklists created to make sure that people are able to ensure compliance with your eventual thing and making sure that there is proper you know data cataloging and access management in your systems to be able to enforce the policies that have been created so we've talked a little bit about uh, you know what all of these things uh, mean in terms of the data and ai world and what quality can be defined as but how does this really influence you know the traditional roles of what people need to do so i think the most important thing that people need to realize is that you know the world of data and ai requires people to uh, you know take on a lot of of new responsibilities take on a lot of new uh, you know knowledge and be able to adapt to this world where things are not the same as they used to be anymore they have to understand that there are new tools new processes in place that require uh, you know people to think of it's not uh, so when we started uh, you know application development uh, 15 20 years back or when i started rather uh, data the use of data in a particular uh, testing scenario or being able to think about where it is used how it is used was not perhaps something that was first in our mind but you know understanding that there are processes related to accessing data to processing data to you know use uh, your your client data for example all of those things have changed completely in today's world there is a lot of uh, focus on uh, governance of data the compliance with regulations and the ethical use of all this data uh, today that were perhaps not there before so making sure that you have all this uh, is is extremely important However, the number one change that I would really like to talk about is the change in the roles of, of folks, right? So it's not just the traditional uh, developers, QAs, BAs, and perhaps the project managers or product managers that are only involved today. There are a lot of new roles that are also involved in today's world. So developers, you know, have to deal with uh, data professionals uh, such as data scientists, data ML engineers, the data product managers were different from the application product managers, for example, uh, data stewards uh, in terms of being able to access or use data. They need to be able to converse with uh, the data scientists uh, on you know, the algorithms in, that are used to model data, to be able to use the data to create value from that data. They need to understand new to storage paradigms. They need to understand new processing paradigms. Uh, tools and technologies related to all of these. And they need to be able to communicate all of these learnings uh, to the other people in terms of what they are doing versus what is expected from them. So it is no more just reading a story, being able to execute that story. They need to understand the, the whys and the whats related to the data and the end use case related to that particular story. They need to be able to articulate uh, you know, any gaps or inconsistencies that they see when they are developing something. Testing all of these uh, you know, from a unit test perspective is extremely crucial to make sure that you know, the, the, the small things don't uh, slip up. From a QA perspective, perhaps I'm a little bit uh, biased over here given that uh, that's my background as well. Uh, this has a huge impact on QAs. Uh, maybe not so much in the model or algorithm part unless you have a very strong data science background or have a lot of knowledge in this particular area uh, but understanding the tools and processes 
that are required for things like data quality management, that are required for you to be a bridge between the technical and the non-technical world, to be able to elucidate the, the goods and the bads in terms of uh, you know, the completeness of what a story needs to be in terms of uh, uh, being able to uh, be a you know, done story for someone to be able to actually develop it is extremely important. It's very important to think of cross-functional testing, not just of the application itself, but of the data platform itself. You know, we talked about things like bias, for example, the ethical use or the governance use, for example. Right? So all of these validations are extremely important for QAs to own and do in a particular in a particular team. From a BA perspective, you know, it's uh, BAs uh, usually tend to be the bridge between uh, the business stakeholders and the and the technical teams. So it's extremely important for the BAs to wear the governance hat and. Uh, We've typically seen on our projects that BAs typically make the best uh, you know, data governance professionals as well. So if you're not empowering your BAs to be data professionals or looking at data governance, please do so. Uh, they need to be able to understand uh, you know, the ethical use of the data and they probably have the best uh, you know, finger on the pulse in terms of being able to understand whether the service level objectives, the policies of the system meet uh, you know the the regulatory demands and the ethical demands on of the of the software that you're trying to create or the application that you're trying to create. They are able to elucidate or articulate the needs of users uh, uh, perhaps a lot better and communicate with the QAs and and the other folks to be able to uh, you know create a system that doesn't just work well from a functional and a non-functional perspective, but meet each of the five pillars that we talked about as well. So eventually, so where do we stand today, right? So why, what does the future look like? The world of data and AI is changing on a weekly basis. So, you know, we've gone from, uh, you know, changes once in every few years to uh, every few months to every few weeks now. In fact, if you look at uh, some of the, the forums that uh, are popular today, uh, you know, things keep changing almost on a daily basis. Uh, AI models, data models, data platforms, data technologies, all of these are, are changing to a point where it's almost impossible to keep up. However, it's very important for us to focus on, you know, the changes that are happening, at least, uh, you know, look at a couple of things that we do well or we want to do well and make sure that we are able to understand what that means in terms of changes to our roles and responsibilities. What kind of process and skill changes do we need to make to ourselves or uh, to keep up with this constantly changing world? We need to be able to wear the hat of, you know, thinking about compliance, ethics, uh, you know, process guidelines, authentication, uh, security, privacy, all of these things, along with, you know, the functional and the cross-functional aspects of a, of a typical application as well. So I'll end on this, uh, you know, I'd like to take any questions that we have, given that we have about seven to eight minutes left. And uh, anything else uh, that you guys want to know about this, I'm happy to connect with you and uh, you know, take this forward. I do double click on this a lot more. Uh, perhaps we don't have time to get into this today, but uh, you know, look forward to any questions that you guys have. Thanks, Bharat. We have quite a few questions. Uh, Although we might not be able to cover all of them, but let's try to answer a few. Uh, I'll be bringing them to this stage. Yeah. So this first one is how, uh, by Irene, how are we able to have the required traceability for AI-related testing to requirements? Okay. So if I can understand that a little bit well, when we talking, when we're talking about tracing. Uh, AI testing to requirements, we're making, we're, we have a requirement uh, to create an AI system and we're making sure that that requirement is getting tested properly. Is that correct? Okay, I'll assume that that is correct. Uh, so given that, uh, I think that's pretty much what we talked about today, right? So in my opinion, there are five things we need to look at to make sure that the requirements are getting tested, right? So just to make sure that I repeat those five requirements again. The first requirement, I'll, I'll go in re reverse order to what I presented over there. We need to first make sure that, uh, you know, the, the story that we have or the requirement that we have uh, or the use case that we have does not violate uh, any of our regulatory 
uh, issues, right? So we have regulatory compliances, we have policies in place. We shouldn't be violating any of those, first of all. If that's good, then we can move on to the ethical part. Are we violating any of our values in terms of what we are trying to create with this? Are there going to be any issues related to bias? Are there going to be any issues related to uh, you know, the fairness of the data or the way that the, the data provides uh, the output? Is it going to be skewed, skewed towards uh, any particular uh, group or community or, or any other you know, end result that we have? If not, then we can proceed to uh, you know, the infrastructure. Is the infrastructure that we have to support uh, this particular system good enough? Uh, typically, that would be at a larger level, but uh, for the sake of you know making sure that we're able to uh, you know create a proper uh, tracing of the requirements, let's make sure that the infrastructure is good. Let's make sure that the model or the requirement is explainable. This is extremely important. We need to have definitions of done. We need to have definitions of done not just from the functional and the cross-functional aspects of it. We also need to make sure that we are looking at what is the data that is going to be accessed? What is the uh, explainability of the algorithm that you're going to be using uh, in terms of what is the output related to the input that you're providing? So all of these things need to be tracked in addition to you know, data quality management in terms of the data that you're providing, the, the completeness, the freshness of the data, and all of those, those parameters. Thanks for the elaborate uh, explanation. Uh, the other one by Snigdha is on the screen. How do you see the interplay between model quality and overall AI system quality? And what are the strategies can be employed to ensure both are man maintained? Sure. And this is extremely important. So model quality, like I said, can be broken down into uh, various aspects. So when we're talking about model quality, uh, there are three things that define model quality. So the first is the quality of the algorithms themselves. Uh, you know, how good are those algorithms? Are they the right algorithms for the problem that you're solving, right? Do they do the right thing uh, in terms of what you're trying to uh, trying to do? So if you're using a neural network, uh, is that the right neural network to use? There are tons of different types of, you know, neural networks itself that you can use, for example. Uh, so that is one aspect of quality. The second aspect of quality is uh, what kind of data are you using to train the model? So all of these AI ML models are require a ton of, of data to be able to do the work that they do. And depending on the type of system that you're using, a generative AI system uh, would use very different data or work in a very different way to a discriminative AI system, which is the kind of AI systems that we used to use before or that most people were most conversant with before. So the quality of the, the data that you're providing it uh, the training data, the validation data, the testing data that you use to determine various aspects of it are extremely important. The third aspect of, of model quality comes down to, uh, you know, the explainability of, of your system. Can you explain what your system is, is providing as output based on the input? Uh, this is very non-deterministic testing to do, to be honest. Uh, so you need to be able to reduce the unknown unknowns as much and to try to make, you know, testing your models as deterministic as possible. Uh, you know, despite best efforts, it is uh, extremely difficult to say with conviction that you are 90% complete in terms of testing or 100% complete because you really, I mean, testing of an AI model or, or a very complex data model is a very non-deterministic uh, activity. So, you know, you have to be able to create uh, some kind of deterministic uh, aspect to this. Use of oracles. Uh, so the oracles are a very old, uh, uh, you know, way of automating things where you provide inputs and outputs. Uh, using oracles is a great way to be able to test for this particular aspect of model quality. So was there a second part to that question? I, I'm not sure if I missed that. Uh, yes. What strategies can be employed to ensure both are maintained? Right. So I think some of the some of the things that uh, I talked about talks about the strategies, but uh, I like one more which I covered during the, the talk, which is uh, tracking the model, uh, the version that you're using uh, as you're going on. Right. So as you keep adding data, as you keep providing more context to your AI models or your ML models, the way that they work change. 
So understanding that, you know, the way that these models keep changing, uh, keeps changing over time, you need to be able to roll back to a particular model if your new newer models with the newer data is not working as expected or start showing bias or start showing, uh, you know, issues with explainability, for example. So in addition to all the things that I talked about in terms of model quality, uh, tracking and making sure that the model version that you're using is, is good is very important as well. Perfect. So Bharat, we are almost on time, but let's take this last question by Matt. Uh, I am pulling this on the screen. What are the some of the most common challenges that arise when applying the traditional software quality methodologies to the AI systems? Sure. So there are a ton of challenges. I'll I'll touch upon the most important ones. Um, so the traditional way of testing an application puts the onus of testing on the QA folks. They are uh, thought of to be the only gatekeepers in a lot of companies, although that uh, has seen a lot of change recently. Uh, a lot of companies, you know, expect the testers to to be the, the final gatekeepers of quality. That is absolutely not the way that, you know, data and AI systems get tested. Everybody owns quality, right from the, the data product manager to the, uh, you know, person in support who trains the new models and, you know, makes it and uh, evolves the way that the system works. So making sure that, uh, you know, you overcome the, the traditional uh, challenges that people have towards thinking about quality in their work saying that somebody else down the road would measure it is, is something that absolutely has to change. Uh, another thing that really has to change is uh, looking at, uh, you know, fixing issues later. So things like governance problems, things caused due to governance, things caused due to ethical issues with the software itself cannot be engineered or fixed later. It has to be thought of upfront. So understanding the, the pitfalls of using your technology of using your paradigm or the use case that you have is is critical upfront. You cannot engineer that in afterwards. Uh, you would have to completely redo your system. So paying enough attention to make sure that all of the regulatory aspects, the ethical aspects get covered uh, as quickly as possible is very important. Uh, another challenge that people have uh, you know, are some of the more operational ones, making sure that your infrastructure is of good quality making sure that the models that you use are the right models for the problem that you have. Sometimes you don't even need AI to solve a particular problem, or you don't need AI to think of your traditional approaches. Uh, a normal functional approach works great, but a lot of people try to force fit AI systems or ML systems into places where they're not required. So that is another a challenge. They try to make everything an AI or ML problem, and it might not even be one, right? So those are things that people need to think of. Uh, Data quality is extremely important always. Uh, it has to be paid attention to at all times because uh, although it might be a, a very simple problem to solve or a simple problem to look at or approach, uh, it is extremely critical in the in the larger platform. So we talked about the Google, Google flu trends example where it was the data quality that brought the wheels crashing. It was not the system itself. Uh, so these are some of the challenges. and. Another one, sorry, is communication, right? So I talked about there being new roles in this ecosystem, data scientists, ML engineers, data analysts, data product managers, people who think about things from a data perspective, not necessarily from your traditional app tech perspective. So being able to communicate with them in their language, with the knowledge that they have, and being able to articulate what is possible and what is not possible when you're working with these folks is extremely important. Great. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a lot of other questions, but uh, for everyone out there, I would say that we th these can be answered on Lambda Test community. Uh, after the conference, we will be reaching out and checking out all the questions and we'll be sharing answers there. Uh, thank you so much, Bharat, for the insightful session. Thank you so much. And uh, for all the folks out there, I would encourage all of you to share about the conference with hashtag testqconf uh, on social media and get a chance to win the prizes. Happy testing and have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Thank you.